Michelangelo's Last Judgment overwhelms viewers with its vast scale and magnificent details, yet the work has never been particularly popular. In the Sistine Chapel, visitors often give the Last Judgment only a passing glance. Most concentrate on the ceiling. It's not hard to understand why. In its beauty and clarity, the chapel ceiling remains remarkably accessible more than 500 years later. The Last Judgment is darker, more complex, and requires more background to understand. At the same time, it's an immensely rewarding work that reveals new details every time you study it. It's a painting worth your time. The most important thing to know about The Last Judgment is that we're not in the Renaissance anymore. Michelangelo completed the chapel ceiling in 1512 at the pinnacle of the High Renaissance, but things began to crumble in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to a church door and kicked off the Reformation. Soon after, major Renaissance figures left the stage. Leonardo da Vinci died in 1519, followed by Raphael in 1520. By 1522, Protestantism was sweeping Northern Europe, shattering the power of the Catholic Church. In 1527, Rome fell to a besieging Protestant army and endured months of horrific violence and plague. In 1534, the last Renaissance Pope died and was replaced with the reformer Paul III. By 1537, when Paul commissioned the Last Judgment, the entire mood of Europe had changed. Confidence had been replaced by anxiety, hope with fear. We need to see the Last Judgment as a product of this time. The Renaissance popes had asked Michelangelo for a painting about Genesis, about the creation of the world and the potential of humanity. Paul asked for a painting about Revelation, about judgment, endings, and the consequences of sin. Let's begin by looking at the work as a whole. It seems confusing at first glance, but there's logic to the composition. At the center top is Christ in his role as judge of the world, with the Virgin Mary at his side. Surrounding him are the ranks of angels, saints, and martyrs. These are the faithful already in heaven. Above Christ, in arched lunettes, are angels holding the symbols of Christ's passion. We see the cross, the pillar where he was whipped, and the crown of thorns. Immediately below Christ, angels blow trumpets signaling the dead to rise. They also hold books, a large one containing the names of the damned, and another, a much smaller volume, the names of the saved. To the left and right of the angels are the souls of the dead. Now it's important to think not about our left and right, but of Christ's left and right. To Christ's right, our left, are souls rising from the grave and ascending into heaven. To his left, our right, are souls being dragged down into hell. In the center, at the very bottom, right behind the altar, in fact, we catch a glimpse into the mouth of hell. Creepy. Can you imagine standing there looking at it while saying prayers? Because that's exactly what the Pope gets to do. Let's focus in on a few details now. First, Christ in the center. Positioning Christ here wasn't obvious. In medieval art, Jesus would have been at the highest point in the middle of the painting. There's a theory that having Christ in the middle with all the other figures moving around him reflects new ideas about cosmology. The astronomer Copernicus had first theorized that the earth moved around the sun instead of the other way around back in 1514. While the book containing his ideas wouldn't be published until 1543, the concept was widely discussed around Europe. We know that Michelangelo was well aware of it. Eventually, the church came down against heliocentrism and condemned Galileo for teaching it, but initially the idea of a sun-centered universe appealed to some clerics. The sun was associated with Christ, so they reasoned that the earth could revolve around the sun just as humans should center their lives on Jesus. Some art historians think that Michelangelo adapted Copernican ideas in his composition by placing Christ with a blazing sun-like disc behind him in the middle of his work. I find the expression on Christ's face terrifying. His hand is raised in a gesture of decisive condemnation. This is not a loving, forgiving Jesus welcoming children into his arms. This is a stern, righteous Christ issuing final judgment. This is it. There's no going back. At his side is the remarkable figure of Mary. The Virgin was traditionally the intercessor, the last resort who could plead for the most hardened sinner. 
Well, not today. She looks away from the damned and cringes to Christ's side. It's too late for intercession. Her crossed hands reflect a traditional gesture of prayer, but here they seem to represent withdrawal. There's nothing more she can do. Now look at the figures around the central pair. Notice how agitated are their reactions. You see shock, fear, anxiety, surprise. No one saw this coming. One figure turns away, his hands held out before him in fear, while the person behind him has his hand over his mouth in horror. Even St. Paul, with his long beard draped in red, is holding his hands up as if to say, Whoa, hold on here. The pugnacious man before him is St. Peter, who holds his traditional keys. We see more saints on the other side. This is John the Baptist. Look at those bulging muscles and popping veins. His head looks too small for his incredible body. Most of the saved are equally muscle-bound. Partly this was Michelangelo's style. He adored painting rippling flesh. And partly it was a theological statement. These are the saved, and their seeming physical strength is intended as a representation of their spiritual strength. They have strong souls. Just a note about this figure, who's been identified as either Eve or a representation of the church itself. Look at her impossible anatomy. As ever, Michelangelo seems to have painted a muscled man that stuck two balloons on her chest. The man was a great artist, but he really didn't understand how boobs worked. At a level slightly below Christ, we see several martyrs. It's always seemed unfair to me that martyrs have to walk around eternity with the devices that tortured them. Here is St. Lawrence with the gridiron on which he was burned, St. Catherine with her wheel, St. Sebastian with his arrows. And here is St. Bartholomew holding the knife with which he was skinned alive as well as the skin itself, to which I'll add, ew. This truly disgusting skin has an Easter egg of sorts. Look at the face. This is believed to be a self-portrait of Michelangelo. If you think about it, there's a theological statement there, that he is only flesh. His body is a shell, a vessel to be cast off. It's a profound statement of humility from a not very humble man. There's much more to see in The Last Judgment, and in future videos I'll look closely at the saved and the damned as they make their way to their final destination. Check back at Lunday.com for future installments of this series. Thanks for watching and let me know what you think about Michelangelo, The Last Judgment, and this video.